Okay, we're live. Awesome. Um, I will go ahead and introduce the show today uh, because Matt tends to have anxiety about it, and then I will um, I'll let Matt do the the honors of introducing the guest. So we are on episode twenty-two. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to episode twenty-two of Undersampled Radio. It's going to be an awesome show today. Um, there are several reasons why that's true, one of which is that our guest is sitting in a room with the exact same colored paint on the walls that I have in my house. So I'm pretty cozy here. I'm feeling like I'm uh, at home, chilling out. But uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention that I think we have actually figured out how to <laughs> analyze, see, understand, and respond to your questions live on air. Um, I don't know if Matt is seeing this, but if, if you log into the YouTube live broadcast of this episode, there is a chat box on the side of the video, where which apparently is different from the regular comments box in YouTube, not live, uh, where you can enter any questions you please. And secondarily, as usual, if you say something on, on our Slack channel, the Software Underground, we will see it there and respond as well. So. Um, now that that's out of the way, uh, I think Matt has one. We actually only have two news bullet points today, so you don't have to suffer through a bunch of news. Matt, uh, what's up? Hi, hello. Um, yeah, just as a quick FYI to you, <laughs> everyone else can ignore this. I don't think I can see, although there is now a Q&A thing in my Hangouts. I, I, it, it gives me a 404, so I don't think I can see the uh, questions. But And I dare not click on YouTube or anything else at this point, just in case it... <laughs> Absolutely not. Negative consequences. All right. Um, well, I will monitor the questions. You, you just. Yeah. Uh, pretty... All right. Excellent. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention, because uh, one of the editors reminded me about it this like, last night, I think. Um, the March issue of the Leading Edge is going to be a special on data analytics. I think they're calling it so machine learning stuff, and. Um, the sort of associate editor that's been emailing me about it is at Conoco Phillips. I don't know anything about any of the um, other authors that are considering putting stuff in. I'm thinking about, well, I will put something in. Um, and we will also do a follow-up, a machine learning related follow-up on something that we're doing next month. Hint, hint. And um, in the leading edge, that is, in October, which I've mentioned before. Uh, but just to say that the normally in the leading edge, the um, deadlines are fairly close to the actual issue. But for these, it's actually in the 15th of November that they want manuscripts, which is quite a long way before March. So just want to get it on people's radars. If you do want to do something for that issue, and I think you should, um, it, you know, it doesn't have to be elaborate or long or uh, anything like that. It just has to be sort of interesting and or useful. Then. Um, get in touch with the Leading Edge editors directly. Uh, you can find them online, scg.org, or get in touch with me. I'd be happy to put you in touch as well. And um, yeah, let's have like a massive showing from undersampled radio slash software underground folks. That would be awesome. Sounds good to me. Um, I will just quickly run through my bullet point here, and then we'll get on to the real meat of the show. <laughs> I'm, let's uh, not just say, it sounds like it's like, Robert's rules or something. <laughs> Moving on in the agenda <laughs> to the next item. <laughs> That's my job. That's my job on this show. You provide the content. I provide the timeline. Okay. Just don't ask <laughs> for like seconding or minutes from the last meeting or anything like that. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so there's been a couple of people that have been following this uh, predictive painting uh, seismic inversion thing that I'm doing, and uh, I wanted to mention that the there's a pause now in the low frequency model building section of the repository, which incorporates the predictive painting. And that is because I have to um, actually do work now for a client. So <laughs> I can't post their data online. So it'll be a couple of weeks while I work on proprietary data. But the next thing that I'm going to do is, is uh, integrate my uh, high frequency inverter that's written in Julia with the with the low frequency model builder that you guys have been following. And I guess that'll just be all written in Python. <clears throat> Anything out of you, Matt? 
No? Okay. Just not the okay. people. Can you just maybe translate that for normal people? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So I want to come up with rock properties from seismic data. And one way of doing that is an automated uh, picking process called predicative painting. And it's pretty cool. I don't know anything about it other than I have picked up some open source stuff and learned how to break it. And uh, now I'm trying to figure out how to fix it. So it'll be cool. And I thought I was going to get a nice snarky response out of Matt there about the Python thing. But um, there we go. Matt, why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah, um, OK. Hi, Amy. Hi, Amy guys. Fox is with us today. And uh, where, where are you today? I am in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> it's nice and sunny. Seems it, like. is, it is a nice sunny day out there. The leaves are already turning and falling off the trees, and we've had two weekends with snow in the mountains wow. already. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. That's cool. Um, so I, 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 probably like a lot of our listeners, I know Amy only really through LinkedIn, or we've not met before today. And uh, Amy's been um, really active on there, blogging and uh, just connecting with people and starting a lot of really cool conversations, um, which has been really interesting because actually I think I'm going to go and go out on a limb. I don't think it's that much of a limb, though. I think this is true that really this is the first time I've seen LinkedIn used <laughs> for, for kind of interesting and uh, awesome purposes in a really consistent way. Um, because before, at least, maybe, it, maybe I was just paying more attention, but before you started this latest kind of um, spike in your activity on there, Amy, uh, there are a few um, little pockets of discussion groups um, where interesting things would come up from time to time. But then the blogging platform was fairly new about a year ago. And um, I was st I feel like every time I log in there, I just see the same thing that I saw last time. It's really odd, except for your stuff. So thank you for kind of, at least for me, rescuing that platform from... Oh, just wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> I did not realize the blogging platform was that new, and so I must have come across it like right when it was brand new. Um, I never really used LinkedIn all that much until I started to get the feeling I was going to lose my job, uh, you know, along with lots and lots of other people. Mm -hmm. um, so I started beefing up my profile and looking at how it worked, and I came across other people's blogs, and um, I just said, hey, I could do this, like, you know. And I started getting so such a good response and so many interesting comments and people reaching out to me that I, I just kept it up. And so I'm not very consistent with it. Every once in a while, I just I get an idea and I think I really this is really coming together into something I want to share and, and see how other people react. As far and as I, I oh, no, please. As far as I uh, can tell, uh, that is the only platform where you host your blog. Do you have another, do you have a private site that you maintain with blog posts? No, I don't. Okay. I'm terribly lazy that way. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's, it's actually kind of neat to have it all linked together. So uh, if you haven't seen her profile, go check it out. It's linked on the show notes. Um, and as Matt says, it's extremely complete. It incorporates actual substantive information, which is refreshing. Um, mm -hmm. And you can read all the blog posts right on there. Um, there's, there's a link to a we actually will get to this in a few minutes, but uh, to one of the specific posts, which is, which is fascinating. But um, one of the interesting things that you have on here, Amy, on the LinkedIn page, is a list of not only publications and experience, but also projects, individual projects, which is kind of fascinating. Um, I find that several of my clients are, for whatever reason, <laughs> I guess they don't want to be associated with me. They don't. They won't allow me to talk about their projects. They won't allow me to post the project names online. So it's really cool to be able to see another scientist on a public platform highlighting at least the the overall goals or, or names of projects. So, um, did you? Are these projects mostly for one um, company? Uh, yeah, they're mostly from the past few years because uh, I I moved to Canada about five years ago now. 
And uh, really, it's been over that last five years that I've become really familiar with various formations here that are important in oil and gas. And I've done a lot of work on them. And it's, it's very important to companies up here that you have prior experience working in the different formations. So one of the very first thing a client will ask is, well, have you worked in the Viking? And oh, well, yes, okay. So I wanted to make it clear. Obviously, I'm, I didn't put very many details in those titles about where or for whom, but at least it shows that I've done work in these different important formations for the, for the industry up here. Excellent yeah, idea. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of derailed my, my own introduction there, and I apologize. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so uh, you're probably sitting there going, so, so what does Amy actually do? So uh, Amy's a geomechanics specialist, um, which I think is called a geomechanicist, but may, maybe a geomechanician. I, 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 I expect you know. <laughs> And you can tell us in a minute. And uh, we and haven't I, settled on anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just found out that her alma mater uh, for undergraduate, I guess, was uh, University of New Hampshire, uh, which is not too far from me uh, here in Nova Scotia. And um, and then uh, Amy did a PhD at uh, Stanford. Uh, so coming out of that kind of um, uh, what do you call it? Center of Excellence, I guess, for uh, rock physics and geomechanics. Uh, did you do anything in between New Hampshire and Stanford? Oh, well, I went out to Stanford and initially got a master's degree, and that wasn't focused in geomechanics, but um, I took some geomechanics courses while I was doing my master's, and I, I enjoyed them a lot. Uh, my, the professor who taught them was Mark Zoback, who's the geomechanics, like one of the founders of the discipline, really, especially in oil and gas. And... Um, He's an excellent, excellent instructor, as thousands of people now know, because he's made his introduction to geomechanics course free online through Stanford. And uh, I know tons of people that have taken it. So uh, lots of people know how good he is. And so I enjoyed his courses a lot. And uh, when I finished up my master's, I needed to stay for personal reasons in that Bay Area um, around Stanford. And Mark had just, along with three research associates had um, just started a company, Geomechanics International, and uh, I needed a job, and they were growing, so um, they took me on, and uh, my interest in the subject just grew from there, and after working for a few years, I figured, well, it would really probably do me good to go back and get a PhD in this. Um, it's, just, it's a complicated topic. It requires a lot of education to really understand, like a lot of things do, and um, so I went back with Mark and as my advisor and got my PhD. And then Geomechanics International hired me back, um, but they were bought within a few months by uh, Baker Hughes. And so then worked for Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes sent me to Canada. And then after a year in Canada, I decided uh, to work for a Canadian company instead of this big international. And now I'm a permanent resident, so I'm sticking around doing my own thing. Right, right. So that is, you said you moved to Canada about, um, or actually to Calgary about five years ago. Um, was yeah. is, is that then when you moved there with Baker Hughes? Yeah. Yeah, right. that, I moved here. Yeah, it was like almost exactly five years ago that I moved here for Baker Hughes. But uh, I, was, I was really done with them. Uh, after a year, they were managing everything out of Houston and that was really problematic because the industry here unlike any other place I've been is so tight I mean the downtown core is it's all in one place everyone can walk around and have coffee together it's not like Houston where if you have a meeting you might have to drive up to the woodlands and it takes an hour whatever um, and the, the community is really tight and um, they it's very local business like I don't know how else to describe it, but for instance, and this is going to sound really stupid if you're not from Calgary, but um, the business development guy for our group wanted to take, he bought some tickets to take some clients out to some stampede events. And stampede is this huge outdoor spectacle here in Calgary. Every summer, every, the entire downtown dresses up like cowboys all for a couple of weeks. And um, so this is what you do in Calgary. And his manager in Houston freaked out and said, no, you can't do that. You can't spend the money on that. And 
just little things like that where Houston didn't quite understand the way things have to happen in Calgary just were really very frustrating. So, uh, so yeah, I, I jumped ship and went to a, a smaller company where I certainly learned a ton, but like every other company in town, they're having a hard time getting through this major downturn. So I had to let some of us go. So we have a varied audience on Undersampled Radio, and most of the people that listen, many of the people that listen, are very specialized in their field, uh, and many of them are geo-related somethings. Um, so I want to ask you a question that we ask every guest, because we have a varied professional people on the show. Um, what is geomechanics? <laughs> Well, I, I saw that you were probably going to ask me that. And then over the weekend, I watched your, uh, your episode where you had Mark Kingay on, and I think he gave an excellent description. I don't necessarily want to repeat it here, um, but he touched on the main topics. You know, in geomechanics, we're interested in the earth stresses, the fluid pressures in the rocks, and the rock properties themselves. And really, anything that involves these three things is, in my view, geomechanics. Um, whether you're doing something to change the fluid pressure, you're injecting fluids or producing fluids, that's a geomechanics uh, situation. So the, the rock is going to respond, the stresses are going to respond. Likewise, if you do something to change the stresses, the rocks and fluids are going to respond. So it's, it's a system, and if you try to understand the system and leave out one of the components, you're just you're not going to get to the truth. So one of the things, for example, um, that I see a lot is that people ignore the wellbore stress concentration when they're trying to understand hydraulic fractures. And um, most of the time it's because they don't even realize there is a wellbore stress concentration. And what I mean by that is if you have a material with a force on it and you put a hole in it, the stresses uh, are changed around that hole and so you need to account for that when you drill into the earth and um, if you don't know that it's a simple concept but if it's not something that occurs to you and you overlook it then your you know your models are going to be wrong or whatever your, your pressures you're trying to predict for operations are going to be wrong so that's kind of what geomechanics is it's really any any way in which one of those three things is changing on a slightly more technical level, how do you do your modeling and what kind of modeling do you specialize in? Well, I guess if I have a specialty, it's um, the application, the specialty is really putting the geomechanical model together, understanding and quantifying what those stresses and pressures and rock properties are. Um, then the application is almost the easy part. Um, and that's a, a really important point to get clients to understand that most of the work, yeah, so they have a question. I want to know what's my breakdown pressure going to be when I try to do a hydraulic fracture. Well, it's a simple question, and the answer is pretty short. But to get to that answer, you have to figure out what the in situ stresses are and what the formation pressure is and how uniform the formation is and um, you know, you have to put that entire model together that then gives you the answer. And so that's where most of the work is. So if I have a specialty, it's in building those models. Does, I mean, does uh, seismic data inform any of that in most organizations or in most analyses? Uh, it's curious. trying to, but integration has been a, a real struggle. And there's several reasons for that. Um, one is that uh, just the scale of the models and the, and the projects are very, very different, and, and the data, right? The resolution we see in a wellbore image log, for example, we can see very small scale features on the wellbore walls, such as small fractures, and seismic doesn't have that kind of imaging capability. Um, I know that a lot of work is being done in trying to understand rock properties from seismic, and that is uh, being used to geosteer or um, to high grade certain parts of the reservoir. So on a big rock volume geomechanics perspective, that probably works fairly well when applied correctly. Um, 
but when it gets down to a specific well bore and problems that companies have while drilling, the seismic is really of limited use right now. But I, I think integration is trying to happen, and I know this is now going to probably lead to the my last post, which is kind of blowing up when you consider geoscience posts. 80 people, <laughs> that's blowing up. Right? It is, it's a good one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of barriers to integration, especially in industry. Um, I know the the two places I've worked that claim integration, they both had the different groups totally in competition in terms of revenue and bonuses and everything. So, I mean, what, what's going to push you to integrate when that is the situation, right? How would you like to see integration between different scientific fields? I mean, for example, um, are we talking purely about a communication on a high level? Or are we talking about actual deliverables moving between departments for quantitative um, interfacing? I think that um, geoscience, geophysics, like we need to, we need to really get into each other's workflows. We need to work together, see what each other is doing, not just hand off different parts of projects. Um, I, I don't think just us sitting around saying, well, how am I going to use what you do? Or how am I going to deliver something that you can use? Um, instead, we need to get our hands dirty together and say, oh, you calculate that that way? Well, in my field, we do it this way. And maybe there's some blended way we can do it that makes sense for both of us and makes the result useful for both of us. But, you know, that takes time and effort. And when you're trying to make money, you try to minimize the time and the effort. Right? Yes, that's true. I actually was, before you said that, I was going to ask you as a next question, as a follow-up, is it possible to do these types of uh, workflow analyses or combined workflows uh, in a field like geomechanics, in a field like seismic inversion um, or petrophysical analysis of a certain well log type? In some cases, it almost seems that you need a PhD to do those workflows, and um, it it may be impractical to even get down in, in the workflows into a level in which you can do this type of integration. I don't want to. Oh, go ahead. Well, I I mean my my thinking is I'm trying to come up with an analogy, but you know in other industries. Um, and even in other areas of the oil and gas industry, you know, companies are willing to invest in development of products and services, right? So this is something that's not going to pay off in a single project. There's one client that's going to come along and say, hey, I'm willing to pay for you to do an integrated project, and it's going to take two or three times as long as it would if it wasn't integrated, and I'll pay for that. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So I think we need to really define what we want the long-term benefit to be from the integration and then invest in the integration. I mean, we put the, the amount of money that went into hydraulic fracture models in the last five, 10 years that were so wrong. I mean, so just completely <laughs> wrong. Um, it's mind boggling. If we had put that kind of investment into integrating and, uh, you know, coming up with the next generation of fracture models, which I think we're just starting to see. There are some companies out there trying to do it. And, uh, you know, the research is finally making its way out of the universities and getting put into applications. So we're on our way there. But I mean, if you do the numbers and you think about the wasted money versus what could be invested, it, it's just stupid. Do you, do you think that's, uh, I, I, th this is kind of a loaded question. Um, I don't know whether to phrase it as a question or an assertion, but uh, I mean, I feel like there's just a, a sort of pervasive, uh, well, we do a horrible job of looking back uh, how, at the performance of projects and um, coming clean, essentially, about how we did in our predictions. And there's just very little technical accountability, not a, so a lack of the sort of scientific uh, approach, if you like, being applied on a large scale to the development of opportunities. 
And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think this is a failing of us, to be honest, as much as it is of sort of organizations, not to press that kind of methodology and not to be really rigorous about how we've done and really honest with ourselves about, mm -hmm. hey, well, we completely failed to um, predict how that was going to turn out. Uh, mm -hmm. cause it, and, I, and I think, um, just to finish my little kind of mini rant, that <laughs> part of what the, 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 there's this kind of uh, confusion in our careers sometimes, and I think this is also partly on us and partly on what we're rewarded for and the way our organizations behave. There's a confusion between our sort of tasks and our purpose. And, and I think that even extends to teams. Uh, I feel like if people were more, uh, if teams were more oriented around what they're actually trying to achieve, then how they achieve it becomes a bit less important. And it doesn't matter if I don't get to do my ABO inversion, because mm -hmm. as the geophysicist, I can contribute in a better way. Do, do you know what I mean? So I, I don't know how to turn that into a <laughs> question, because it's more <laughs> of just a statement. But um, does that does that resonate with how you've seen teams work and how you see sort of integration coming undone in in subsurface? I, I do partly, but I think a bigger barrier is um, the restrictions put on everybody. I mean, we know our purpose. Our purpose is to, you know, predict where the oil and gas is, go get it safely and economically, and, you know, plan out how it's going to go so that we've got the right equipment on site and everything else. I mean, that the purpose is pretty straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. But then we're hobbled, right? We can't get to that purpose because we're told, okay, but you have to give us this answer in a day and uh, with no data. And, um, you know, so just pull it out of thin air. I mean, I gave a, a talk once that people loved because I pulled out a crystal ball. Like I really did. I took out a physical crystal ball and I said, this is not you know, my tool, <laughs> but this is what people ask me to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you've probably experienced this as a consultant, but I mean, and I don't want to whine too much, but I mean, it's pretty common to kind of have this conversation where the client asking for something awesome, and you're like, yeah, here's, here's all the things I would do uh, to get that awesome result for you, and here's what looks great, I want you to do all of that, but I only want to pay 30% of what you've just kind of pitched yeah. at me, and it's like, okay. I don't know how, like, it's really hard to move that conversation on. It's right? very hard. And I see it even within the operators. I mean, a good technical team is asked to do something for a project mm -hmm. and then told they can't have the data. Well, right. you know, it, it's not just on the service side. And no. until that mentality changes uh, or, you know, until, you know, maybe that's something that'll shake out of this current downturn is that there are companies who put the effort in, who got the data, who are doing well, who, who are going to make it through this downturn. And it's because in part of really good technical rigor and some of the less rigorous players just aren't going to last. And, you know, maybe that's one thing we'll see as we come out of this is that there'll be a value put on science again. This leads into a question asked by one of our listeners. Um, the question is, do, are, are companies doing geomechanics wrong? Um, some are, some aren't. Um, when I got into it, there were uh, a few companies, really big ones, that had some internal experts. Um, and they've maintained their internal expertise at a pretty high level. You know, big players like Shell, BP. Um, and some of the really most famous people in the field have come out of those programs. And many of my fellow graduate students went into them. But then you've got um, smaller operators. Uh, well, let me back up a little bit. You know, geomechanics wasn't very well known back then. And it's become much more in front of everyone with the advent of hydraulic fracturing. Um, and the old applications are still around, like wellbore stability and sand prediction. And so um, the awareness has grown. The, the, as an academic community, we haven't been able to supply high level expertise at the rate in which it was in demand um, in the industry. And uh, so a lot of people with 
part like a related education or um, maybe a junior geologist who took Mark's online course or something and that these people are being asked to do geomechanical analyses. And not only did they maybe not have the background or experience to know what to do, they also didn't have the tools to be able to do it because really there were only a few very specialized and very expensive um, software programs out there for people to use. So, so you don't have the knowledge to do the work, you don't have the tools to do the work, you try to kludge around everything and you end up with something that's, you know, not good, not valuable, not correct. And I think that turned a lot of companies off of geomechanics. I think that really did a disservice and is continuing to do a disservice to the discipline. Uh, people are trying, I call it do it yourself geomechanics, you know, a petrophysicist is like, oh, I can calculate stress and I'm just going to do it from this log. And well, okay, but you know, you're in a really highly tectonic basin. You're not in the Gulf of Mexico and you can't do it that way. It doesn't apply. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a struggle. It's a, it's a struggle that we have. The only way we're going to get around it or get over this hump is through education. And I'm, I struggle every day with how to, how to do that. Yeah, it, and it seems, I mean, it's often quite a slow process, isn't it? And I, 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 I totally recognize what you're saying there about the kind of early, um, the early years of some new technology or some new approach it is clouded and confused by this kind of mad rush to apply things, but maybe not always all that rigorously. Mm -hmm. And and then and then things don't work out, and people get to say, "Oh, we tried that. That doesn't work." Exactly. Yeah. Data <laughs> science. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> machine learning right now, where um, but, you know. I think exactly the same thing's happening, and it does kind of it weirdly, sort of ironically, unfortunately, sets everyone else back. So you've then <laughs> got to kind of prove it all over again. Maybe that's just how it has to be. I don't know, but it does seem like it's very predictable. Well, it sounds like it sounds like you have a good pitch. So um, you've been out on your own for almost a year now. Um, it seems to me, uh, from a scientific standpoint, that you're offering an amazingly valuable service, uh, but as we all know, it's not as easy to peddle <laughs> an amazing service as you might think. So um, how's it going over the past year, writing and creating and making and, and then doing the business stuff too? Yeah, um, well, you know, my former employer got rid of the whole group that did geomechanics, so I had a few clients that followed me who still needed some work done. and, and um, so I quickly set up my own company so that I could meet that demand. I had a few projects, pretty much always had a little project going on up until about a month ago when things kind of stopped completely. And that's not surprising. Summer is so slow around here and then people finally get back to work September, October, and it picks up again. So, um, so one of the things I've been doing is trying to stay really active in, um, the professional organizations, there's some really good ones locally here in Calgary that, you know, they, they apply to all of Canada, but they're based in Calgary, like the Canadian Society of Petroleum Geophysicists or Geologists, and then the uh, Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And they're, um, you know, their offices are here. They have monthly publications or maybe they're going to every other month now, a lot of them. And uh, they have committees and we put on a conference, a joint conference here every year. So I've been trying to stay really involved with those, not only to promote geomechanics and educate people and maybe hopefully get some work, but also because, I mean, these societies are struggling along with everyone else. I mean, it's not just the companies that are struggling. And, um, you know, I know a lot of them are offering reduced rates for, for luncheons and conference registrations and I have tried not to take advantage of that very much because I feel like I'm not in a position where I have to choose between going to a conference and, you know, buying shoes for my kids. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that conference and try to support that organization. Other people are in different situations, so it's understandable if, if they do take advantage of that. Um, we need authors for these publications. It's a lot of volunteering. 
Um, yes. And, but I think it benefits me and it benefits the organization. So I, I'm trying to keep doing that. Plus you, it gives me um, a lot of different ways to speak out. I can write articles, I can um, share sessions and, and be selective as to who gets to talk in that session. I, you know, I can give lunch talks and it's a, it's a great way, to, multimedia way to uh, get out there. Given your sort of uh, progressive way that you've been engaging with your community <clears throat> and the wider community recently, um, and Graham's going to accuse me of of opportunistically <laughs> using <laughs> using this thread to um, to bash on uh, technical organisations, um, but I'm, I'm I'm not completely going to bash on them because I, I you know I'm involved in SEG quite a bit and I used to be involved in. Um, the organizations in Calgary want to live there, but um, my perception is that they are some a little bit um, kind of just putting their heads down and trying to carry on do the things that they've always been doing, publishing stuff and selling advertising and organizing big conferences because those make money or did in the past, mm -hmm. and and not kind of at least playing around a bit with some other ways of of interacting with the community, at least not my perception is, bearing in mind that I'm in Nova Scotia and a long way from Calgary where I miss a lot of stuff. Um, mm. My perception is that then they could be doing more to explore some of the new media, for example, um, doing stuff a little bit um, sort of more cost effectively maybe without publishing actual physical stuff and like mailing uh, magazines to people, but still getting the exposure, still having channels for advertising revenue, um, mm -hmm. but innovating essentially around new ways of publishing, new ways of getting people together and collaborating. Do you, do, mm -hmm. it, am I being unfair there? Do you think there is enough going on? Uh, is, are, there, are there other things you'd like to see happening in that on that front? Um, definitely. I think from what I've seen, I was on the AAPG Education Committee for several years, um, been involved in other organizations, and I think exploring other avenues like webinars and um, you know digital conferences or whatever, it, it's been on their radar for a long time, but it's always been on the back burner because it was not the main revenue generating activities for it, you know. So there'd be some specialized person in this huge organization and it was their responsibility to make it work. And I think that was really unfair. Um, so I think just behind that, I mean, what we're seeing here, I keep thinking it as like, see as a kid or any other game with dice, there was a cup and you would put the dice in the like that's what's happening right now. Uh, sorry, I missed that last bit. These employees, professional and what comes out. <laughs> sorry, Amy, so I lost not, it around the, um, the, the cup and the dice. Exactly what it's going to be. Am I cutting out uh, too much? We yeah, we just had a little uh, internet um, mishap. I think Amy, it's on your side. Uh, well, Dave. If you could turn your bandwidth down on that little um, Wi-Fi-ish looking signal on the top of your screen, there it might help. Uh, Matt, you're still coming through clear to me. Uh, am I sounding okay to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you sound good. Um, uh, do we still have Amy? I think uh, I think we may have lost her. We'll wait for her to, to um, jump back in if she if she relogs in. Um, we have we actually sort of um, it's been a fascinating conversation, and we're we're uh, running a little short on time. Um, there were a couple other things we wanted to mention, and these these are a couple of quick bullet points we can hit while um, Amy's logging back in. Uh, one is. Uh, Several of her blog posts, as I mentioned, are, are available right there on the main screen of her LinkedIn profile. Uh, we have a link to the um, integration and geoscience uh, blog post right there in the show notes, and you guys should read it. it it's uh, 
it's it's Matt Hall esque. <laughs> it's very it's it's awesome. It's it's opinionated and fun. So check it out. Um, we were sort of moving right there into the conversation. Uh, to it, we were, I assume, about to mention that that um, Amy has uh, been approved, or or the committee has been approved at SPE um, to uh, to specialize in geomechanics. Um, and there's a couple of uh, names you might recognize there um, as uh, chair people, I think. Um, but there's a link on the show notes also to check out the um, geomechanics technical session in the SPE. Um, so yeah, so it sounds like there's an opportunity to build some open source geomechanics software if anyone's listening and itching to try a kind of uh, hacker project. Um, you know, that would be, I think, readily consumed by, like, anytime all there is is super expensive niche software products. Um, I th and, and, and it can seem really daunting to say, oh, my goodness, I, I don't know how I would build a tool like that. Actually, I think it turns out that 90% of people are doing this one piece of the workflow, uh, you know, or let's say 80-20 kind of rule kicks in, and you actually only really need 20% of it to service most of the people who are touching these pieces of software. So um, I think it would make an awesome uh, hackathon project or a weekend project for someone to start putting something together. Um, so if you do, please share it with the community. Uh, I encourage you to make it open source, at least at first. For the budding, for the budding geophysicists and physicists and open source project weekend warrior type of folks, I, th you, I think it's a really cool area as Matt says, to specialize, or not to specialize in, but to start building something, and especially if you don't know anything about it, because um, it's it, it li this field lies at the intersection of kinematics and geology, and it's really quite interesting. So I had a, I had a, a question. So the, the show notes, the show notes, in case you've never <laughs> read one of them, it's basically a brainstorm where we just kind of like throw ideas out there and usually mine are terrible. Uh, there's a note on there. I, I kind of wrote this question late at night. It turns out it's not even really a fully formulated thought and everybody <clears throat> bashed me for it. <laughs> but the point, I guess the point I was trying to make is along those same lines. So uh, this intersection of physics and rocks pops up in a lot of different areas, right? So you, you know, petrophysics and geophysics and geomechanics. Um, I, I would love to see in the form of some open source project, maybe starting from first principles or somewhere thereabouts, uh, a really basic tutorial maybe of uh, ah. the basics of geomechanics. And um, it looks like we have Amy back on the line um, Amy, do you hear us? Nope. Okay. Um, so uh, that's all I have, Matt. Do you have any other bullet points you want to cover? Um, I don't, other than to say thank you very much to the uh, absent Amy, um, Amy Fox, uh, who's been uh, I, I really identified with a lot of things that she was uh, she was talking about. So I think maybe we um, we get her back on the show sometime. Uh, I'm perhaps. Well, Oh, here she Hello. is. She's back. I'm crying. She's back. Hey. Uh, we we're just saying uh, we should we should find a way to get you back sometime to uh, chat about um, well, how, you know, how, how it's going, but also check in on some of these things around conferences and technical societies and um, see if anyone responds to the plea for some open source geomechanics software that I just issued. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are a lot of people out there inventing their own, so um, it will become okay, well, available. I heard through the rumor mail of one that's available for a monthly fee. Okay. I personally am helping out with uh, a former colleague who's built some, and I'm helping him test it and do some. Okay, that's awesome. Maybe we'll so, see. Definitely going to be a lot more there to choose from. Yeah, if, uh, if if you ever feel like there's enough of them out there to warrant kind of listing them off, that always makes a good blog post. That's true. Um, and again, we look forward to seeing some of that software. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Amy Fox for coming on the show today. Um, 
it has been a fascinating talk and we will uh, link everybody in on the show notes so that you can go uh, check out some of her uh, publications. Matt, with that, I'll say see you next week. Oh, no, wait, don't, we, I won't see you next week. No. I will see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, in a couple of weeks. So I look forward to it. See you later. Hasta la vista.